it is well known now, um, and it's reported very frequently, that some food is good for you and some is not. Um, there are some foods that are claimed to be against inflammation, like uh, tomatoes, fruits, nuts, olive oil, lean grief, and fatty uh, food coming from fish like salmon and so on and so forth. While there are other foods that are claimed to really induce inflammation, like junk food, including fried food, sodas, refined carbs, and so on and so forth. What is the science beside this? Uh, not much. We don't know that much. And I believe that, again, finally, we're taking a much more closer look, look uh, to make you know, a, a statement more mechanistically link this kind of food stuff to clinical outcome. And that will be mainly the focus on the discussion today. Why this is important? Because particularly in industrialized countries with the Western lifestyle, we've been witnessed during the past few decades and epidemics of chronic and inflammatory diseases. For example, allergies and inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's disease or you know, ulcer colitis are becoming more and more frequent. And the timeline of these epidemics is way too short to claim genetic mutation to be responsible. Rather, it looks like that we change the environment way too fast for us to adapt as a species. And the price that we pay as a consequence is this, you know, epidemics of chronic inflammatory diseases. For example, we see not only an increase of these conditions, but also serious complications like food anaphylaxis, that is a serious, possibly deadly consequence of food allergies. They've been increasing not only in the timeline, and as you see in the slides, that a matter of three, four years. And is not affecting only young kids as typically was the past, but also older kids like, you know, kids in the five to 14 years of age. Among all the epidemics of this chronic inflammatory disease is probably the most impactful and, and, you know, serious that I've been witnessed in the past few years is the epidemics of autism. You see in this graph, you know, the epidemics of autism in the past 30 years that went from a one in 5,000 rather even rare events to what now the CDC seems to put at one in 68. So even this slides is obsolete uh, frequency of autism among kids. If you consider there is a four to one ratio male females, that makes in the next generation, one boy out of four will be out of business. Uh, because of uh, the autism epidemics. And this is something that we need to take very, very seriously. What is the reason why we have these epidemics? Again, there are several theories, not mutually exclusive, but the most popular one that was put forward a few decades ago is what we call the hygiene hypothesis. If you've seen these slides on the left-hand side, you see the uh, you know epidemics of the classic disease that were important in terms of impact for human health, both in terms of morbidity and mortality, namely infectious diseases. You know, our species until the recent past, you know, will die mainly because of infection. Then the antibiotics and increase of hygiene came into fruition, particularly in distressed countries. And, you know, in a matter of few years, we we're able to really abate tremendously the frequency of diseases like measles, rheumatoid fever, hepatitis, tuberculosis, and so on and so forth. So we really brought these infectious diseases almost to zero. But during the same period of time, at the same latitudes, we experienced a gradual increase of non-infective chronic inflammatory diseases, mainly autoimmune diseases like diabetes, uh, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, like celiac disease, and uh, multiple sclerosis, and also allergic and other chronic inflammatory diseases like asthma or neurodegenerative diseases like, you know, uh, uh, Alzheimer and uh, other neurodegenerations, including, you know, um, autism. Bottom line, we don't die fast of infectious diseases anymore, but we die slowly of these chronic inflammatory diseases. There are rampage epidemics in the past two years. So we claim and blame the fact that we became too clean for our own goods as responsible of these chronic non-infective inflammatory conditions that we're experiencing so far. But the other message to these epidemics and epidemiological evidence that is, if you want to see the glass half full, is that, you know, with the understanding 
that these epidemics are materialized in such a short period of time that, again, it's mostly due to environmental factors. A corollary of this evidence is also the fact that because we're born with specific genes that, you know, modern nature dealt the wrong deck of cards to us, that's not destiny that we develop these diseases. If we do or do not, it really depends on our lifestyle. And that's what I believe that, you know, the new science is giving us not only the understanding why these chronic inflammatory diseases are materializing, but also possible targets to really stop and possibly revert these epidemics by trying to understand why this is all happening. And in digging in this kind of understanding, the equation to develop this condition now is becoming more and more clear. The two pillars of the you know, mechanism that leads to chronic inflammatory diseases that we've been working upon as a working hypothesis until the recent past, they're still there. So clearly you have to have a genetic predisposition and some environmental factors that are mismanaged by your immune system because of genetic predisposition leading to chronic inflammation. These are both necessary, but now it seems they are not sufficient anymore because other three elements, at least other three elements, seems to be at play. The third is this increase of permeability at the forefront of these frontiers with the environment, mainly the gut. So an increased gut permeability or leaky gut that is one of the topic of discussion today. So that these two worlds, genes that live within our body, and these factors that are typically segregated and kept at bay outside of our body will physically interact because this large molecule will gain access, you know, in our body and therefore seen by the immune system. A fourth element is the immune system that should not work the way that it's supposed to be anymore. So in other words, the immune system that is supposed to protect us start to be belligerent against ourselves and create this chronic inflammation. And last, and but definitely not least, this ecosystem of microorganisms living in our you know, body, mainly in our gut, what we call the microbiome, seems to have a great deal to do together with these other four factors in leading to the clinical outcome that, you know, we're going to discuss today. The other thing that seems to be apparent nowadays is that these elements are not completely disgregated and, and independent of each other. Rather, they influence each other big time. So an increased gut permeability can change the behavior of the immune system or the composition of the microbiome. And vice versa, the composition of the microbiome can change the permeability of the gut or the way that the immune system defend or attack ourselves. And of course, the microbiome can change dramatically the genetic makeup of us by epigenetic pressure. So in other words, they, the microbiome composition can change the, our genetic predisposition in clinical actuality, actuality under specific circumstances. This kind of five pillars of chronic inflammation are based also on the evidence from the functional aspect, anatomical aspect, how our immune system in the gut is arranged. What you see here, it's the cross-section of a gut of a mouse, but it's identical to the, the cross-section of the gut of a human being. With the hole in the middle being the gut lumen, where food and other stuff come through, that we definitely distinguish and react to in terms of what to do with that. If they're friends, they're welcome to be there, if they are enemies, we definitely need to get rid of them and stay alerted and be ready to fight. This single layer of epithelial cells that you see here in red, not only are important to digest and absorb food stuff and therefore decide who stays a bay into the lumen who comes in, but also offer this barrier that segregates this external world of potential you know, enemies from our you know, internal body. And again, like the wall of a medieval city, there are openings, there are levee bridges that you need to bring down and to bring merchandise and friends in, but they need to be closed right away so that, you know, the enemy can keep at bay. That's the concept of modulation of gut permeability. The problem arises when these levee bridges are stuck open down and therefore there is a promiscuous entrance of friends and foes into the wall of the city and that is the premise to develop inflammation. And that's the essence of what we call a leaky gut. 
but as any kind of you know CD, you have also soldiers there in the CD that will protect us. And these are the immune cells. Start from the one that you see here in green. They are the first comers when we are under attack. What we call the neutrino cells. They can even send the periscope in the lumen to scoop who is there and be prepared to the war. Then the beta cells that you see here in blue, they produce specific weapons that we call immunoglobulins. They can be sent out to the world, the city, i.e. in the intestinal lumen. That these are, will be the secretory IgA that will eventually fight the enemies outside our body. And finally, the most belligerent of immune cells that we have, the T cells here in white, that when are, you know, um, activated, they really deployed heavy weapons that can create a lot of collateral damage, so severe inflammation. Not only in the gut, if they stay there, but they can migrate and they can go anywhere in the, in the body and then create inflammation anywhere else. Now, in terms of these levy bridges, this, you know, permeability gatekeepers that we technically we call tight junctions, until the recent past, we didn't know that exists. We thought that the wall was sealed by a cement so that everything was close to the world. Uh, and only in the early 70s we realized the existence of these levy bridges. They are very complex, you know, structures that indeed we call tight junctions. And over the following few decades we understand more and more of their complexity, but one element of knowledge that was missing is what makes these levy bridges to come down. So in other words, how we modulate the permeability of the gut. And that's when in the late 2000s, um, early 2000s, we discovered this molecule, zonulin, that remains the only physiological modulator of gut permeability that is capable to make sure that these levy breaches come down when it's needed and that will close when they are not needed anymore. Interestingly enough, when the zonulin gene was cloned and was located this tiny chromosome, chromosome 16, that hosts 3% of the entire human genome, uh, but it's packed with genes that are related to a variety of conditions that they have chronic inflammation as a common denominators, including autoimmune disease, cancer, and disease of the nervous system that you see in these slides. Interestingly enough, when the zona gene was cloned, it was linked to the same three categories of, you know, chronic inflammatory diseases. So it's involved in conditions like ankylosing spondylitis, celiac disease, uh, type 1 diabetes, among, you know, autoimmune diseases and uh, brain cancer, ovarian cancer, and pancreatic cancer among the cancerous, the tumoral diseases. And finally, this is the nervous system has been linked to multiple sclerosis, schizophrenia, and ultimately even autism. As a matter of fact, this table shows, you know, an exhaustive list, but not quite complete list, of all autoimmune diseases and, you know, neurodegenerative diseases and tumoral diseases, and in general, chronic inflammatory diseases have been linked with, you know, uh, the uh, gene of zonin that when it goes out of control and it's produced too much will make this levy bridge to get stuck open and therefore create the syndicate for chronic inflammation. If we dig into the reason why this zonin system goes out of control, intriguingly enough, food, specific this protein gluten that comes from grains uh, like wheat and the microbiome, both seems to be responsible for activation of the zonin pathway. And this brings me now to the part of the discussion on the microbiome. We went aware of the microorganism, and I start to say at the beginning of our discussion, because we were subjected in terms of, you know, mortality to infectious diseases that the main and, you know, until the recent past, almost exclusive cause why people there would die. And, you know, silly enough, when we discover, you know, antibiotics and start to develop vaccines, we're convinced that we won the war. But again, the premise of this war was that we have to fight, you know, this microorganism at all costs because they want to kill us. What we didn't appreciate at that time is that anything else in life, they are good guys and bad guys. So there are definitely bacteria that want to kill us or definitely are detrimental for us. But there are a variety of bacteria that are very beneficial to us, that we live in symbiosis with, that we co-evolve with, because since we appear on the face of the earth two million years ago, we evolve with the presence of microorganisms, so we have to come to this negotiation of how we survive together and how we help each other. 
So when we went to war with this microorganism that were pathogenic to us, then we end up to wipe up also the good guys. And th these good guys that really represent another ecosystem, a, 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 another, some people they go to the stream to call it an additional organ of our body, are, you know, instrumental to make us whatever we are. So it should not come as a surprise that if we touch this, you know, community, we will pay consequences. And the point being, it's not just the fact that we are too clean for our own goods that leads to this chronic inflammatory diseases as the uh, gene hypothesis seems to support. It is because with this hygiene and this intervention and change in lifestyle, we end up to impinge only on the good guys. And therefore, we don't have that kind of good balance of this ecosystem that help us to stay healthy. So the fact that, you know, eventually we change our lifestyle too fast to adapt by changing the environment, now is getting more and more attention. And no matter if you look at, you know, pre, peri or post nano factors in the environment, like the lifestyle of our mother when we are pregnant with, uh, the way that we're born, a C-section or vaginal delivery, the way that we have been fed, um, you know, breast milk or formula, or the number of antibiotics that we receive or number of infections that we receive, or even later in life, other things that comes up play, like traveling, stress, and so on and so forth, they all have as a bottleneck the fact that you change the composition of the microbiome because they all can change the composition of the microbiome there seems to be the transducer of all these environmental factors that can have a negative impact on our clinical outcome. And because of that, we eventually get this level of imbalance in the microbiome, what we call the dysbiosis, that among the other things that can change the gut permeability, so making the intestine leak, making this influx of non-self antigen coming through, and depending who you are genetically speaking, sooner or later you can lose tolerance and develop a chronic inflammation that, depend who you are genetically, can end up with an autoimmune disease, or an allergic disease, or cancer, or anything else. So if this premise, this kind of working hypothesis, will prove to be correct, now we have at least a target to stop these epidemics and eventually rewind the tape and go back to where we start from and trying to ameliorate this epidemic of chronic inflammatory disease that we have. Uh, you know, experienced the past two, three decades. So going to gut dysbiosis, what we're talking about here is, again, one of our organ, if you want to call organ, this ecosystem, the microbiome, is not working properly. So as we will pay consequences, our liver, kidney, or pancreas will not work well, the same, by the same token, we will pay consequences when our microbiome goes out of balance. How that happened? And again, this seems to be more linked to modern lifestyle, what is the Western lifestyle. And these slides really depict what are the possible two extreme scenarios that we're discussing here. If we're close to the way that, you know, the program of evolution design us as an individual, so how we evolved for two million years. So we're born the way that mother nature decide us to be born, by vaginal delivery. We've been fed proper nutrition, so proper food, and we discussed a little bit more in, in details that. No absolute infection, scarce use of antibiotics, all this maintain the microbiome composition in balance. It should not be a surprise to us that a balanced micro microbiome is the best teacher for the our immune system to decide if and when to unleash inflammation. Again, two million years ago, our ancestors would die either infection or a predator would eat them. The average survival age was 20 years. No time to develop autoimmunity or cancer. So the main, the main job of the immune system was to fight infection. And the infection, you know, will eventually instigate the immune system to deploy weapons that will create inflammation. Inflammation is nothing else. An unfriendly environment for microorganisms to grow is too hot. There are chemicals and substances like cytokine and chemokine they are very detrimental to bacteria. So you will kill the bacteria in that particular environment. Of course, you will kill the tissue as well because inflammation will kill the tissue. 
but will you save the entire body that will be spared from death? But because of that system is work only when we are in a major danger, if the immune system is taught properly that by balanced microbiome, the threshold to unleash inflammation is put very high. So only in excruciating extreme circumstances we unleash inflammation. Conversely, if you look at the Western lifestyle, and therefore the right hand of these slides, you know, use and abuse in C-section even when it's not clinically indicated. We feed the kids not their food, so actually I don't know if we can call food what we feed our kids nowadays. A lot of infection and a use and abuse of antibiotics, and particularly in the early stage when all this teaching is made, the first thousand days of life, the immune system now will be taught by an imbalanced microbiome that will instigate and will instruct the immune system to unleash inflammation even when it's not needed, even for three reasons. So the body is very low. So you now are exposed to chronic, continuous instigation of inflammation. It's only a matter of time that on a specific in the genetic background, your risk to develop a problem will be much, much higher. Mother Nature also is teaching us that this microbiome imbalance is extremely important to us. Looking at the composition of breast milk, there are some components, particularly the sugar components that we call human monogolosaccharides. They've been a puzzle for many years for scientists because those sugars are not made use of by babies. They cannot use that as a nutrient. So we didn't know what these sugars were doing there until we realized that the purpose of these sugars is to feed the good microbiome. So in other words, to make sure that the good bacteria will thrive so that will eventually live in symbiosis with us and will protect us against you know, possible onset of diseases. And the establishment of the microbiome at the beginning seems to be completely random and chaotic. You know, some bacteria, they start to colonize and then they disappear out of the calm and they go up and down until everything's settled by the end of the first year. This apparent chaos is actually a very tightly controlled maturation of the gut microbiome that is needed to go through these steps to really reach the maturity of a balanced you know, ecosystem that will protect us. And this ecosystem, indeed, during you know, the first few weeks and months of life, will instigate this rich environment, a microenvironment in the gut in which you know, enemies and friends and the immune system and the barrier, they all in synchrony so that everything works the way they're supposed to be. So enemies will keep at bay. Friends are welcome to come in. The gut permeability is modulated the right way so that we keep a state of health. Now, if we look at what are the elements that, again, brings to inflammation, and we go back to the diet, the, you know, of the slides that I showed you before, you're born only once. And you may eventually be exposed to antibiotics here and there a few times during your first year of life. Or have an infection once in a while. But you eat three, four times a day. So of all the influential factors that can change the microbiome composition, diet is by far the most influential of all. And there are these, again, anti-inflammatory diet that we start the discussion with our first slides that we profess out there and we ask ourselves what are these anti-inflammatory you know uh, uh, food stuff that can help us there is no clear answer there but the logic is to look again at history where we come from how we as a species evolved as an individual what we're used to it our ancestors for almost the entirety of evolution until 10,000 years ago when agriculture came into the picture. We're eating fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, lean meat, these are animals that were escaping predators, so they were lean, fish, tuber, nuts, that was olive oil, that's pretty much what it was. And a lot of fruit and vegetables and, and nuts and tubers because you just, you know, take them from there, they don't run around very little fish and meat because rarely you catch these animals. So bottom line, what I'm describing is pretty much what we call a Mediterranean diet. There are a lot of food pyramids 
that tells you what you need to lead a lot and what you have to lead very little. And they change all the time. And this is another example of a pyramid of based on what I just told you, what is more logical to embrace a lifestyle. But I want to point your attention to the base of the pyramid, what you need to do the most. There is no food there. It's a lifestyle. Lifestyle that we have been abandoned in, in uh, you know, Western countries. We rarely enjoy ourselves as a family. We rarely enjoy a meal together. We rarely grow whole together. We don't laugh as you, we used to, and definitely we don't spend time playing outside, rather we stay on the couch playing video games. All this will have consequences on these, you know, beautiful machines that we evolved with uh, two million years of history, and now we pretend to do something else in a such period, short period of time that definitely we are not able to adapt. And then, you know, the food comes into the picture. And you see that, you know, everyday base, you know, vegetable fruits, uh, uh, you know, olive oils, and, and wheat, and so on and so forth, and going to the top of the pyramid in which you have to use more uh, sparsely. Um, I'm going to finish up to give some practical example of what kind of clinical consequence you can have when either because, you know, your nutritional, you know, situation or other factors that change the microbiome composition, you will have the perfect storm of an imbalanced microbiome and increased gut permeability and therefore the syndicate for chronic inflammation. And I will take, you know, as an initial example, um, you know, spon ankylosis spondylitis, so a disease that doesn't involve the gut. And then we will talk about obesity and fat liver, and we're going to finish up with near inflammation with autism. So, this paper that was published not long ago links what was unthinkable until the recent past. An inflammation far from the battlefield, not an intestine. So we're talking about joint that has been fueled by the upregulation of the molecule that makes the intestine leak zonulin and imbalance on the microbiome. And again, without going too much in technical details, these slides summarize that individual affected by this condition compared to normal individual, in their guts, they have the machinery that control permeability uh, trijunction affected in a way they got leakier because some of the components like occludin and claudin-4 are not expressed the way they're supposed to. And, you know, zonulin is upregulated. And they had an interesting finding on the surface of the gut of this individual. There are bacteria that can induce these changes. They are not present in health individuals. Going to obesity, this is an interesting observation. For example, if you look at the uh, bacteria composition, the microbiome of identical twin girls, one that is obese, that is on the top, on, on the bottom, and one that is lean, that is on the top of this line, you see that the obese, you know, microbi the microbiome of obese twin girls is less diverse than the uh, counterpart, you know, um, a sister, a twin sister that is lean. Now, the general rule is the more diverse the microbiome, the more balanced and therefore beneficial it is. So in obesity, it looks like there is a, a less diverse microbiome, so a more belligerent microbiome, so to speak. And what is the theory beyond this linking the microbiome imbalance to leaky gut? It looks like that this increased gut permeability is triggered by this dysbiosis is associated with this chronic low-grade inflammatory tone that will eventually instigate inflammation that will hint into the liver, creating a fat liver, and then metabolic changes that leads to obesity. And indeed, you know, we know that some of this instigator chronic inflammation come from bacteria, like lipopolysaccharides, so this endotoxin that instigate the inflammatory process. And there is this vicious loop between a loss of bladder function, the, Im the immune response to the gut associated lymphoid tissue. This changed the gut flora that in turn increased gut permeability. And now you are in this vicious loop that is, you know, also, you know, aggravated by external factors like stressor and, uh, you know, cytokine release and genetic susceptibility and so on and so forth. I'm going to a rapid, you know, list of, you know, evidence in the literature linking zonulin in this case with uh, uh, obesity-associated insulin resistance. 
and here not a paper with the relationship with serum zone with clinical laboratory uh, you know parameters or childhood obesity this paper for example uh, show that the more zone in you have the less you know you have in terms of glucose tolerance so there is an inverse correlation there and also that the more zone you have the more you know you have a fat liver a matter of fact you know there is a direct proportion between mild moderate and severe you know uh, fat liver with increase of zone levels so the more zone levels you have the more severe is the uh, um, you know a uh, fat liver and I'm going to finish with autism this will take an entire you know new lecture but just to say that if you look at the microbial composition of kids with autism compared to the one that do not they have a different microbiome and you know recently we published this paper that is simply prove a concept that say if you change the microbiota composition in the autistic kids in this case by doing fecal transplantation that is one crude way that you can change microbiota composition you ameliorate their behavioral problems you ameliorate their GI problems and they feel much better over time so I'm going to finish up by saying all what we discussed today putting all these pieces of the puzzle together it really tells us that we are in charge of our own destiny. We can't change again the fate of the genetic makeup that Mother Nature gave to us. We can't definitely mod modify that. What we can modify is our lifestyle to make sure that this genetic makeup we don't translate in disease. You know, we made the mistake by changing lifestyle and increasing these epidemics of inflammatory bowel disease. By the same token, we can switch back to a more, a more you know, natural lifestyle. Of course, I'm not advocating to go back to the cave and, work and live as a caveman. But definitely, the first thousand days of life, the way that we handle pre, peri, and postnatally our next generation will really dictate their future, not only as kids, but also in the future. And if we play our cards well by improving a good lifestyle, particularly the nutritional parts, we can definitely ameliorate this chronic inflammation. I want to finish by acknowledge, you know, my entire mucosal immunology biology research center crew here in Boston at MGH and Harvard Medical School because this group of people are outstanding, you know, scientists and clinical investigators that made possible some of the discoveries that we discussed today and they continue to work very, very hard toward the goal to achieve, uh, you know, the best possible you know, uh, potentials based on what is our genetic makeup by trying to understand targets that we can uh, really go after for improving quality of life for people of the next generation.